On April the 7th, 1968, a racing driver was killed in a Formula 2 race in Hockenheim, Germany. Sadly, the driver's death was not a surprising occurrence because such was the danger of the sport back then. He was one of 127 racing drivers who would die at the wheel that year alone. This time, though, the death sent shockwaves through the motorsport world because it had just lost the man who was unquestionably the greatest racing driver of his day and who many argue is still the greatest of all time. Jim Clark has died in an accident during a Formula 2 race in West Germany. It was a terrible shock to everybody. It really knocked us all back. If there was anybody who was not going to have a fatal accident, it was Jim Clark, because he drove in such a way that he just didn't do the mistakes that other drivers did. In California, a radio station broadcaster announcing the news of Clark's death asked his listeners to turn on their headlights as a mark of respect. And the freeways lit up. Such a huge global fuss would not have sat easily with Clark because this shy, modest man, the son of a Scottish sheep farmer, was never one to trumpet his own skills. I started as an amateur with no idea or no intention of uh, becoming world champion. But uh, it was, I was curious to find out um, what it was like to drive a car fast, to drive on a certain circuit, to drive a certain type of car. Having cut his teeth in sports car racing in the late 50s, Clark's speed and talent was spotted by Lotus boss Colin Chapman, who signed him for his Formula One team in 1960. Clark soon set the motorsport world alight, especially in this car. The Lotus 25, in which, in 1963, he won his first F1 World Championship. Oh my God, I am sitting where Jim Clark sat. Slightly alone. Thanks to its revolutionary monocoque chassis, the 25 was stiffer and lighter than any other F1 car, which meant it wasn't just fast on the straights, but quicker through the corners too.
And in the 1963 season, Clark used it to win a record seven out of the ten Grand Prix. Winner is Jim Clark. Nobody could possibly catch him now. But 1963 was just a warmer for what was to come. To get a true picture of Clark's genius, we must look at another year, 1965. When he hit heights, no driver had reached before, or has done since. A modern Formula One driver does 21 races a year, and often complains that's too many. In 1965, Jim Clark raced in 63 races. Some of these cars look similar, but they are all completely different. In a car like this, he'd do Formula One Championship. He raced in the British Formula Two Championship and the French Formula Two Championship in this car. He raced in the Tasman Series, a sort of Australian Grand Prix for Down Under, in this car. And then there's this Lotus Cortina, in which he decided to race in touring cars. And then if all that wasn't enough, he decided to go for the Indy 500. First up was the Tasman Series in Australasia. Out of the 15 races, Clark won 11 and took the crown. Then it was back to Europe for the British and French Formula 2 championships, both of which he won. Jim Clark led from the start. Winner is Jim Clark. And in between the F2 races, he was jumping into his Lotus Cortina and racking up touring car victories. And on top of all that, there was America. The Indianapolis 500 has been called the greatest spectacle in racing. America's most prestigious race would be a tough challenge. Oval racing at higher average speeds than he was used to against seasoned Indy veterans. For the Indy 500, Clark raced a specially developed Lotus, producing just shy of 500 horsepower. However, although he already had a Formula One world title to his name, the Scotsman's CV cut no ice with the sniffy Indy officials, who made the upstart from across the pond take a rookie driving test before he could compete. <laughs> We're off. Come on, come on, come on. Wrong 
Come Indie Weekend, the upstart from across the pond qualified on the front row. And then, in the race itself, Clark, up against America's finest oval races, won by just over two minutes. Jim Clark, first European to win at Indianapolis since 1916, set a new record of 150.686 miles per hour. So what was it that made Clark so good? What was it that made him capable of winning in any type of car? Jimmy was an absolute natural driver, and he did it without thinking. He didn't know why he was driving in this style the way he did. In the period that we're talking about, we had one and a half litre cars, 200 horsepower. If you drove the car too hard, you would scrub the speed off. And if you lose a bit of speed, it's very difficult to actually make it up again. And that's what Jimmy had the knack of keeping the momentum of the car going. I don't think that any of the modern drivers could have driven the car anywhere near as quickly as Jimmy did, because he was just so precise. Besides a supernatural ability to coax speed out of the car, Clark also possessed another vital skill. A lot of very good racing drivers died in Lotuses because the Lotus was a very fragile car. But Jim Clark was so smooth that he never put too much stress on the areas of a car that would give up. But don't think for a minute that Clark was one of those drivers that could only win in a perfect car. One year at Spa, for example, he was leading the race when his gearbox started to let go. Did he give up? Nope. Instead, he drove the rest of the race, and we're talking 160 miles an hour in the wet, with one hand on the steering wheel and the other holding the gear lever in place. And he still won by nearly five minutes. So let's just sum up Clark's season of 1965. Of the 63 races he contested, he won a staggering 31 of them and was on the podium a further eight times. He was now seen as the greatest racing driver of all time in demand the world over. Yet this shy Scotsman chose to mark the year's achievements with a modest celebration at his hometown back in Scotland.
The next two years, by contrast, were a disaster, with multiple mechanical failures denying him another championship. However, in 1968, driving the Lotus 49, another game changer from Colin Chapman, Clark took the first win of the year in South Africa and looked set for another dominant season. Congratulations, gentlemen. This is an absolutely splendid effort. OK, thank you very much. And then, on the weekend of April the 7th, Clark had a choice of two races he could compete in, one at Brands Hatch, the other a Formula 2 race at Hockenheim. Faithfully, he entered the German race. April the 7th is a, is a bad day for me. He wasn't happy. It was freezing cold and damp, misty. We could not get any heat into the tires. Couldn't get any temperature in them, no matter what we did. Jimmy said to me, for the way, do not expect anything from me today. Just keep me informed with the pit board, where I am, how many laps to go. That's the last thing he said. On lap five, Clark's car suddenly speared off the track at 170 miles an hour. When he died, he was just 32. But in his short career, he had racked up some truly incredible achievements. In Formula One, he won 25 of his 73 races, which in percentage terms puts him way ahead of Hamilton, Vettel, and even Schumacher. In pole positions, he had 33, which again in percentage terms makes him second best of all time, just behind Fangio. He was a benchmark. <laughs> that was it. Most of what I was able to do in motor racing was done by the manner in which Jim Clark drove. And I just followed him. He was a gentleman. He was a gentleman and a gentleman. It's a pity he's not around now, because it'd be nice to have him. <laughs> 